folks, welcome back to My Kitten Reads. I'm Eleanor and this is my October reading wrap up. So, um, it's November already, can you believe it? Years 2018 is already o almost over. Um, but yes, October was a pretty good reading month in that I caught myself up to my Goodreads challenge and I read 12 things. But they're 12 very heavy things because they're 12 very heavily graphic orientated and heavy short story orientated. So, I mean, of course, it did help that I A, was reading graphic stuff and B, had the Dewey's 24 Hour Readathon. But um, yeah, it did catch me up to where I needed to be to be on target to reach my 120 books for the year. So ba I've reached 100, so I basically had 20 more to go. Um, the start of this month has been slow, but that's because I'm waiting until my exam is over uh, next week uh, before I really start getting into things. So, but anyway, what did I read in October? So the, the I started the month with, oh, these are heavy. Hang on. These. So these are four different Asterix graphic novel omnibuses. So each omnibus has um, three different graphic novels in it. Um, I read Asterix when I was a kid, um, along with a lot of Tintin stuff, because that's what our library had in terms of graphic stuff, and my brothers really liked them. Um, Tintin doesn't seem to hold up as well, I've noticed when I try to go back and read it. There's some really, really difficult sort of race stuff in there in particular. Um, but... The asterisk stuff, although some of the artwork is a bit problematic, um, particularly with the odd African character, um, the artwork's a bit problematic, and some of the stereotypes, well, it really plays into stereotypes, uh, stereotypes, and some of them are a little problematic. Like, I wasn't entirely comfortable with one of the stories where that had Jewish characters and they were merchants. So that was a bit problematic. But as an adult, the language jokes, like most of the jokes in Asterix are to do with language and what things are named and how they use quotes and stuff. And I, as an adult, I find those completely hilarious. Um, I didn't even notice them most of the time as a kid. As an adult, I noticed it all, all the time. Um, you know, even down to um, sometimes there's a song, you know, there'll be a character singing a song and I'll recognize like the folk song that it's based on. Um, but it's been adjusted. So um, I read four omnibuses. So two of the ones were rereads in that I already had the omnibuses. Omnibus I? Hmm. Um, anyway, buses, I think. Um, and then I bought two more. I usually try not to buy these because they are very expensive. But I was in a mood and that first week of October. So I bought two more. And so I have... Uh, Omnibus 1, which has the first three stories, then technically it's Omnibus 2, but I think these must be different publications because the, um, yeah, the spines don't actually match, the pictures on the spine, which is a pity, but that's got books 4 to 6. Um, I have Omnibus 3, which has 7 to 8, and I have Omnibus 9, which has 25 to 27. So there are a few stories in here that I hadn't read because, like I said, most of my stuff that I read as a kid was based on um, what my library had. But yeah, so that was a really fun start to the month uh, with four massive, heavy, really heavy um, Asterix omnibuses that I'm about to put down. So then I continued on my graphics kick because this came out. This is volume one of Check Please, book one, Hockey, by Ngozi Ukuzu. Ukuzu? Ukuzu. Um, this is a really great uh, webcomic that I fell in love with a little while back um, and I've been reading it on the web but she started public she got a publishing deal to publish the first book and I think there's going to be a second book as well which covered this book covers the first two years so um, check please is the story of Eric Bittle who has gone he's from Georgia he's gone away to college on a scholarship to play hockey he used to be a figure skater. Um, he loves baking. He has a YouTube channel where he vlogs about baking and making jam and all that kind of stuff. And he's gay. And he's not exactly out. Particularly not to his parents. Because he's from a southern state. He's from Georgia. Um, you know, which is, you know, stereotypically more conservative. But, so he joins the hockey team. But he's like the smallest member of the team. He's really fast. He does not like being checked. In fact, he has a phobia of being checked, which I believe in hockey is when another player crashes into you and knocks you over. Um, 
yeah, hockey, ice hockey, kind of violent sport. Um, and then he meets uh, Jack Zimmerman, who used to be a very famous junior player, who's the son of a former NHL player, and he was going to be drafted for a professional team, and then he disappeared. Um, there was a big scandal. He, I believe he had an overdose or something like that, and ended up, because he has anxiety, and ended up in rehab and is now the captain of the Samwell men's hockey team. And so this is the adventures of Eric as he gets used to being at university, um, as he meets and makes friends with all these hockey players, and his relationship with Jack Zimmerman. So um, this is the first two years of him at university, and it's adorable and I love it so much. It's so beautiful. Um, as you'll see, I've actually purchased quite a few um, graphic novels this month, so I probably won't actually do, I haven't decided yet, but I probably won't actually do a book haul because you'll see most of them here because I've read them already. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, this is Check Please, book one, hashtag hockey by Ngozi Ukazu. So yeah, check out this out if you can, even if you want to read the web comic on Tumblr. It's brilliant. Then, more, more massive excitement in that same week in October when it comes to graphic novels. My first ever pre-order at a comic store, my first ever pull list where I'm getting things issue by issue as they come out, is this. It's Shuri, issue one, by Nelia Corafor, Leonardo Romero and Jordi Belair. Nelia Corafor who I've spoken about on this channel because I read her prose, I read the Binti series, and I read um, the Book of Phoenix, and she's brilliant. She writes really brilliant Afrofuturism. She's a Nigerian-American author. Um, I think she's American, but yeah, she's of Nigerian ex extraction. Um, and she is writing Princess Shuri's very own, first time around, her own comic. I've been so excited about this. So this is issue one. Um, as you can see, they've taken a lot of the um, visual cues from the movie Black Panther, even though the movie Black Panther is a different continuity than the comic Black Panther. But they actually did a really good job in this first issue of letting you know where the comics were up to and what had happened to Shuri in previous Black Panther comics. Because Shuri is, of course, the younger sister of um, T'Challa, who is the Black Panther. And she has, in fact, been the Black Panther herself at one stage in the comics. Um, so they've taken a lot of the visual stuff and bits of the character from the movie and they've combined those with the backstory and bits of the characterization from the comics of Princess Shuri and given her her own story. So this is the first issue. It was really good. It's very much an introductory issue. Uh, one thing I will mention that I absolutely loved, there are barely any men in this comic. This comic is almost all black women. So there's a couple of scenes, like there's one where T'Challa's going on a mission with another guy and to get him off page basically um, <laughs> for this. And there's a couple of other like pages where there might be a very brief sort of male character. Um, like there's a flashback, for example, of T'Challa training with someone. Um, but it's only for a page or two. It's mostly, and then there's this group of women. There are more women and it's, it's Shuri and it's all these amazing women in Wakanda, which is a fictional African country. And it's brilliant. I'm really looking forward to issue two this month. Um, I've still got a few weeks to go until that comes out, I think. So that's Shuri issue one. Okay, and then we come to the stuff that I read for the readathon. So we will start with Binti by Nettie Okorafor. It's been a bit of a Nettie Okorafor month. So this is Binti the Night Masquerade. This is the third and final book in the Binti trilogy of novellas. Um, I won't spoil what happens in here, but I really, like seriously, I got so emotionally attached and I got so, like, I couldn't put it down and I ended up stop reading it, stopping it, like finishing it at one in the morning. And it was just because I couldn't put it down. But yes, the Binti trilogy is basically, it's space, it's science fiction. Uh, Binti is a woman of the Himba people on Earth. Her people do not leave the planet, but she has been accepted into Umza University, which is on a different planet. And she's the first person of her tribe to have been accepted. 
And so she sneaks off without really telling anybody to go to this university. And so the first book is what happens on her journey to the university and starting to interact and there's aliens and all that kind of stuff. Then the second book is when she comes home. That's called Binti Home. So it's her first return after a year after she went. She's returning to the planet, but she's a changed, changed person. Um, and this is a direct sequel to Binti Home. It literally happens, starts hours after Binti Home. Um, and disaster has basically come to her people and she, you know, things happen. Um, it's brilliant. It's Nadia Okorafor. It's Afrofuturism in space. And it's lovely and I love Binti and she's amazing. So that's Binti the Night Masquerade by Nadia Okorafor. Then I read Showtime by Narelle and Harris. This is a little collection from 12th Planet Press, um, which has four stories in it. They are horror tropes, but as I discovered when I was reading them, surprisingly, because, you know, I'm not much one for horror. In fact, I could barely watch this last week's Doctor Who episode because... <laughs> um, anyway. But, yeah, they were horror tropes for me. So there were two vampire stories. There was a zombie story and there was a ghost story, all in modern day settings or in modern settings um, and all with some sort of message, I want to say. Not necessarily twist, but yes, twist. But it's more has something deeper to say about society and about people um, through the lens of the horror tropes. Um, so this collection of short stories was really, really good and I would really recommend picking it up because I loved it. I also finished Mother of Inven Invention by, uh, edited by Rivka Rafal and Tansy Rand Roberts. Um, this is one of the books that I have kickstarted. It is an anthology of short stories um, about AI, but not AI as we usually see them, but AI either created by women or agendered people or, or AI that are female or agendered. Um, and basically it's exploring lots of different ways where when you change the gender perspective of the narrative or the gender perspective of a creation, whether it be the creator or the createe, how that changes the story. Um, so there are some really, really great, great stories in here um, off the top of my head. Um, I can't exactly remember. <laughs> but yeah, like there's one. Let's say, for example, Selfie by Justina Robson. It's about all these little, everyone's got a little personal AI that like runs your life for you and what happens when the programmer behind that sort of releases mm, more information and the uh, AI start working together rather than for humans kind of thing. Yeah, so um, rebellion in the AIs. But yeah, so there are lots of really, really interesting stories in this. Um, yes, really, really recommend it. Sorry, I should have probably double checked for some stories before I started this video. I've had a really busy day. So, uh, <laughs> but yes, Mother of Invention. I also read, and this is my final graphic novel for the month, uh, The Lumberjanes Band Together. Um, this is by Noelle Stevenson. Um, but also, I think, she, I think she must have taken a break because it's also written by Shannon Waters and Kat Lay and it, yeah, illustrated by um, Brooke Allen and Carolyn Nowak. Um, but there's a really distinct difference. The first issue in here looks like the previous stuff. Um, and then there's a, and it's, it's like a one shot thing. And then there's, it changes to like a longer, longer storyline. Um, and the artwork changes. And I really, really didn't like it. It didn't look, yeah, I, I, like it just changed the way they looked and I had to actually figure out who was who again. Um, yeah, I just didn't like the change in the art style. So the story was still really, really good, um, but I did drop it a star um, when I rated it because yeah, I wasn't impressed with the change in the artist, to be honest. Um, I also read <laughs> the one thing that's not short stories or graphic novel, because Binti is technically a novella, Lady Jane Grey, A Tudor Mystery by Eric Ives. So, um, yeah, so this was an exploration. It's on my list of biographies for the year because it's, you know, it's named after Jane. But it really was actually an exploration of um, what happened 
uh, in 1553. So yes, 15, totally 15, yes, 1553. Um, that put Jane on the throne for 13 days and then turfed her off it. And it does it by not only going around the context of what was going on at the time, but it also like does little profiles of um, all the characters involved in that succession, succession crisis. Um, and then you know, looks really deeply into what the documents that survive of the time and you know, where was everybody, what were everybody's motivations, you know, when exactly did various decisions happen, all of that kind of thing. So it's really digging into that sort of mystery of what happened in the succession crisis in Britain in 1553. And if nothing else, I finally remember that it is 1553. And then I finished off the month by reading this, which is an anthology called World's Next Door, edited by Tani Wesley, or Tani Croft as she now is. Um, yeah, and it was really great. I wasn't actually, I don't think I realised that it was like middle grade stories. Um, so mostly Australian, I think, middle grade stories with a speculative angle. So fantasy, sci-fi, uh, horror, but dealing with like, a, you know, worlds, you know, the worlds that people live in worlds that people go to or travel between that kind of thing but there's quite a lot mostly Australian settings I think as well um yeah and it was really fun and really cute there were lots of cute stories there was even a middle grade Karen Warren story which kind of freaked me out a bit I didn't know Karen could write middle grade but apparently she can <laughs> um but yeah so that's a really cute set of stories that I would really recommend particularly if you've got sort of primary school aged kids um yeah, so those were the 12 things that I read in October. So I've up to, I got myself up to 100 books. I have 20 books to read for the rest of the year. Uh, like I said, I'm a bit slow start to this month because busy um, and stressed. But, you know, I'm also taking most of December off work to go to visit my family. So I should be doing a lot of reading then because I'll have a lot of time on my hands. The Kindle might be getting a workout, let's just put it that way. Um, anyway, that's my October reading wrap up and I'll see you all again really soon. Bye.